good morning, good evening, good day. Wherever you're at, I'm glad you're here. And for those of you that are back, welcome back. I'm so glad that you decided to come and listen to God's word today. Let us pray. God, you are holy. May your holiness and glory be magnified today. May you reveal to us your will and put it into our hearts. Thank you for giving us your word, that we may know you and we may know your thoughts, that we may hear your words. Thank you for providing for us our needs, for hearing our requests, and for watching over us. Thank you for your guidance, for always looking after your children. Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes to what you want us to receive. May we be humbled before you, that you may be glorified. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Last time, we learned about John the Baptist's ministry, paving the way for Jesus to come. Jesus started his ministry and began his teaching in Galilee. His message, simple, straightforward, the time is now, repent and believe. We will be resuming in Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As with the last message, I will always be paying special attention to the words of Jesus. Follow me. Jesus said, follow me. Jesus calls his children in a very direct, authoritative way. Follow me. There is no condition, prerequisite, or terms for his calling to us. He simply said, follow me. What did these disciples do once Jesus had called them? Mark loves to use this phrase all throughout his book to show the urgency and speed of the action of Jesus and his disciples. It says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. They did not hesitate. They didn't have to go check with anyone or see what their calendar looked like. They dropped everything they had and followed Jesus. Later in the book of Mark, In chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus encounters a wealthy man that asks, what must he do to be faithful to God? He's already followed the Ten Commandments, done his sacrifices, done pretty much everything as far as the actions that would require for him to be righteous. And Jesus tells him, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, for you'll have treasures in heaven, and follow me. Now that isn't to say that Jesus desires that we should be poor, destitute, hungry, suffering, we're not taken care of. This is serving to highlight what we should be willing to do to follow Jesus, which of course is anything and everything. Some people who are faithful to God have no struggle with money. And God has elevated them to be wealthy, as well as serve God for his glory. A perfect example of this is God's servant in the Old Testament of Job, who is not only shown to be one of the wealthiest men in all the land, but also the most righteous and obedient. On the other hand, there are plenty of people who seek wealth and allow it to become an idol. I mean, not just money, but any earthly riches. But whether it's riches, women, men, fame, influence, power, or anything else on this earth, we are to leave it for the sake of Christ and God's glory and to follow him. Jesus then goes on to say that beyond that, he will make us fishers of men. This serves as both a reference to Jeremiah 16, where God promised that he will make fishers and hunters of men to return his people back to righteousness, back to the covenant with him. 
Jesus will make us fishers of men. This goes back to touch on the role of sanctification that we talked about earlier in the chapter, of making us holy, set apart from the world. Christ will use us to turn people away from the world, back to his grace. Have you ever met someone that is so different from others, you can't help but want to find out what makes them different? That is precisely what Christ calls us to become. He uses imagery like the salt of the earth, a city on a hill, a light that shines unto all the world. This is what his purpose is for us, to glorify him through that contrast. Later in the passage, you also see a distinction between two types of fishermen that Jesus called. The first pair were fishing, probably on their own, and they left their net to follow Christ. To contrast this, James and John left their nets in the hands of hired servants to help their father in the family business as we read ahead. Verse 19, And going on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So these second group of fishermen seem like they were a different kind of fishermen. Uh, Family business, maybe even owners, or at least their father was. But that isn't even the largest discrepancy amongst Jesus' apostles. While a great number of them were fishermen, business owners, even still, Matthew was a tax collector, which was a relatively wealthy and dishonest profession, by contrast to people who work with their hands. Simon was a revolutionary, an anarchist, who maybe was a politician, but was looking to overthrow the Roman government before he met Jesus. That's why he got his nickname, the Zealot. Paul, who you'll meet later, was a Pharisee who actually persecuted the church and later was a tent maker to provide for himself after he left the Jewish tradition. All these different men were from different walks of life, different religious levels, varying degrees of sins on their hand. But none of that matters in Jesus' name, for Christ is a unifier just as the law is a unifier. Romans 3, verse 23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Meaning this, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you're from, who you know, or how much money you have. All of us are sinners that do not meet God's standard of morality on our own. The good news is, that doesn't define us. Ephesians 2 verse 8 tells us, By grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Your life will be changed, your sins forgiven, and it doesn't cost you anything. Salvation is through Jesus' sacrifice. If you repent, believe in that sacrifice as a payment for your sins, you're saved. That's it. And at that point, Jesus calls us to follow him, to be his disciple. Jesus wants you to follow him. If you're ready to do that, search your heart. Repent of your sins. Put your faith in Jesus as the payment for every single sin you've ever done and commit your life to God moving forward. If you need help, have questions, or need some clarity in being a disciple of Jesus, reach out to your local church, or you can email me, justscripture1990 at gmail.com. The address will be below. 
I will personally talk with you through whatever concern or whatever help you need. Let us close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for sending your Son to pay the ultimate price for our sins. I'm so grateful that there is nothing we can do to earn that gift, and that it is not expected of me to deserve that gift of my own works. We know that Romans tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am so grateful that though I deserve the consequences of my own sin, you have instead gifted me eternal life through Jesus. For anyone that repented and turned to you today, I pray that you will fill them with joy and hope in the promise of that gift, that you would help them become connected to you and to others that believe in you. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit and that we would be the city on a hill, the light to the world, that we might represent you to the world. Give us the ability and courage to be righteous and holy, that you may be glorified. I ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless all of you, wherever you are today, and have a great week. I'll be praying for you.